we have something very special for you guys tonight. So I'm going to get on with it. Um, in honor of the 94th celebration of the late uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we want to talk about Bayard Rustin, a prominent gay black man in our history books, who's most notable to the African-American civil rights movement was his planning and execution of the historic 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedoms along with Dr. King. And tonight on He Said, He Said, He Said, we are honored. It is our pleasure to have Walter Nagel joining our show. Walter was Bay Bayard Rustin's partner for a decade and is the executor of Rustin's estate. He directs a small private foundation and works with groups seeking to lift up Mr. Rustin's name and his accomplishments. He is an administrator on the Facebook page, Brother Outsider, The Life of Bayard Rustin. Walter Nagel was one of the first LGBTQI partners to accept a Presidential Medal of Freedom on behalf of their partner. And he co-authored Troublemaker for Justice, the story of Bayard Rustin, the man behind the March on Washington, published by City Light Books. Please welcome to the He Said, He Said stage, Mr. Walter Nagel. Mr. Nago, hey. thank you hey. for being here. <laughs> How are you this evening? <laughs> I am well, thank you. Thank you so, so much, much for joining us. Thank you, yeah, thank you and for I'm... inviting me uh, as we finish up a week of celebration of Dr. King's life and we start to move into Black History Month. Yes. Well, well and, and I'm gonna say this was really a short notice for you joining us tonight. And I just want to extend another thank you for that, um, for, for being here. And again, we said it behind stage, but it is an honor to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So, that word. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so Pleasure. I'm just, I, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start it off. Uh, Mr. Nagel, so you met Bayard Rustin in April of 1997, and you were partnered for 10 years until his death in August, 1987. How and where did you two first meet? So just a, a little correction. It was, we met in 77. 77. I think you said that. Yeah, because uh, we went, we were together from 77 ah, to 87. You, I, excuse me. Okay. It was right. April. Hey. That's all right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm still here. I wish I could turn time back. Thank you. You know, we're Thank getting you. a little older. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I really, I met Bayard really quite by chance. Um, I had lived in New York for about seven years at that point, And New York was a pretty tough place in the seventies. And I had decided I was going to move out to the West coast. And I was going to uh, a, a newsstand in the Times Square area where they sold papers from all over the country, indeed all over the world. And I was going to pick up a San Francisco Chronicle because I had decided I wanted to move to San Francisco and, you know, start looking at what the job situation was like, the apartments, things like that. And while I was standing on a quarter waiting for a light to change, uh, I looked, suddenly I looked and there was this very handsome, tall, friendly, uh, very well-dressed gentleman. Uh, and he said hello and we started talking and the conversation lasted for 10 years. I... I did get the newspaper, but I didn't make it to San Francisco. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Like destiny. Like, you know, we talk about serendipity on this show all the time. How incredibly serendipitous. Absolutely. And again, I, I, you know, 1977 was a wonderful year. So uh, I actually, that was one of my favorite years. So again, I'm going to apologize for screwing up 1997 and uh, 1977 and saying 1997. So, okay, I'm done. I, I've <laughs> well, Mr. Nagel, after you graduated from Fordham University with honors, I might add, uh, you moved in with Bayard into the Mutual Redevelopment House, which has since been reclassified as a historical landmark in 2016. How did you guys do that at a time when same-sex marriage wasn't legal? Well, the, the complex that I live in, it's commonly called Penn South. It's about three blocks south of Penn Station, and it runs down to 23rd Street uh, in Manhattan from 8th to 9th Avenues. And it was a very progressive um, progressive housing development put up by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. 
in the early 1960s. In fact, President John F. Kennedy came and was part of the dedication ceremony in May, I think it was, of 1962. He was here with Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, some of the important labor leaders and Nelson Rockefeller, a lot of government officials, because this was really a housing project that was built to be affordable for, for working people, uh, to you know provide them with good housing. Uh, and Byard uh, was one of the people, he, he applied uh, to come in and was accepted because he had a very close association with the labor movement, uh, partly through his work with A. Philip Randolph. Um, and so he moved in here in 1962, about a year before the March on Washington, uh, and several other people who worked with him on the march, including uh, Eleanor Holmes, who is now Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, lived in the housing project during that summer of 63. And a lot of some of the planning sessions for the march took place in this apartment that I am still in. Wow. So uh, to get back to your question, uh, <laughs> Well, Byard and I were living together, and he was, you know, 37 years older than me. And I think we both mm -hmm. assumed that if we both lived out our natural lifespans, he would probably die before I would. And mm -hmm. he wanted a, to find a way to uh, make me his heir, his executor, and to, you know, try and protect my rights as best as he could. Mm -hmm. And so he looked into the idea of adopting me. And so we decided to take a chance on that. We got a lawyer and we went through uh, formal adoption in the state of New York and it was approved. Uh, probably one of the very rare ones at that time, if possibly the only one. Um, but it, it, you know, it legalized our relationship. And so at the time that he passed, I was le uh, legally able to stay in the apartment. Wow. wow. Amazing. Amazing. Forward thinking and very Absolutely. good use Absolutely. of the legal system working to your benefit. And <laughs> brilliant. And a testament to the creativity that we've always had to uh, exhibit in order to simply exist. Yeah. One word yeah. comes to mind, progressive. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And you know, Bard was Bard was a very creative person, a very mm -hmm. creative thinker. And that entered into all of his his work with the movement, all of the things that he planned and organized. Well, you know, I, I, and Bobby, I know you were getting ready to ask a question, but can you, I, I'm, I'm so curious about what type of person was Bayard, if, if, you, if you could put that into context and share that with us. Sure. Well, I know, you know, if, if you've only seen the Bayard that appears in Brother Outside or the documentary or some of the old, old news, news footage of him debating Malcolm X, you know, he really comes across pretty fierce and sometimes angry and um, very um, militant, nonviolent, but he was militant and he was not afraid to speak his mind and speak truth to power and stand up for what he believed in. Um, but when he wasn't out there being the activist, uh, in his personal life and his working life, he was very gentle, very uh, loving, understanding, very kind, uh, especially to people that he worked with. Uh, people loved to work for him because he was, you know, he really was one of them. He was not, he didn't put himself on, on this pedestal as the boss or anything like that. If there was work to be done, Bard was always there to pitch in and everybody, everybody did what needed to be done. Uh, and this, you know, really came from his years in the 40s and, you know, 50s before he started working for Dr. King, when he was really a grassroots organizer, a grassroots activist. So he, you know, he did it all over his lifetime. And he really was sympathetic uh, as a boss to the people that uh, worked with worked with him. Uh, he had a tremendous interest in art and music. Um, great. Uh, he was a wonderful singer. Uh, some of you may have heard his recordings. Um, so he, I would say, you know, you hate to kind of use the old cliche Renaissance man, but Bard really epitomized that, that idea. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mr. Nagel, in 2013, on Bard's behalf, you received from President Obama the nation's highest award to a citizen, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Could you just share with us uh, what that experience was like and your thoughts that you accepted that award on his behalf? Well, it was, it was thrilling. Uh, it was not something, certainly when I was growing up and before I met Bard, it was not something that I 
thought would uh, that I would even visit the White House, let alone be part of a ceremony there. Um, but you know, 2013 was the uh, 50th anniversary of the march, and a group of us kind of organized and reached out to people who had worked with Bayard, uh, the major civil rights organizations, his biographers, uh, political people, to write letters, um, you know, sort of, I guess, nominating him, if you will, for the award. It's never really quite clear how these things happen, but we had a lot of support from a broad range of people in social justice movements and in politics. And I got a call from uh, Valerie Jarrett, uh, President Obama's uh, close assistant at that time, associate, uh, telling me that they had decided to give Mr. Rustin the medal and they wanted me to come down and accept it on his behalf uh, in November. I got the call in late August. Uh, going there, I mean, it was it was a great day. Uh, it was, you know, the, President Obama, he had, he, the years under President Obama were, were, were difficult. I mean, he was trying to do really, really good things, and he was getting so much pushback and so much resistance from the opposition. So going there on a day when you were giving out awards to people and celebrating their lives, it was really kind of an up experience for the Obamas also. Uh, and it was wonderful for me to meet people that Byron had worked with. He worked with Gloria Steinem. She was also there that day getting an award. Uh, he worked with Reverend C.T. Vivian, who was a, a, mm. a very... Um, prominent civil rights activist Absolutely. during a close mm -hmm. associate of Dr. King. So it was great to meet them and, and, and be with them and share this, uh, you know, kind of celebration of several activists getting the medal that day. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. The first one I want to ask, I mean, you met Bayard on a street corner in Times Square, not in a sleazy way. Did you, when did you find out or when did you realize who he was? Well, when he when he he said hello, <laughs> I was like, so you knew who he was at the top of that. No, he said hello. hello I'm Bayard Rustin. I mean, I <laughs> I knew. I mean, I knew who Bayard Rustin was when I was growing up. Okay, because I was somebody who was interested in the movement. Ah, I was very okay. interested in the philosophy of nonviolence, okay. and I was seeing it played out on the television. Uh, you know, when I was in the middle school and high school, because, you know, the movement was happening then and reading about it in the papers and Bayard's name was always coming up. And since he was so closely associated as kind of being the the master of nonviolent direct action, uh, you know, he, I kind of latched on to him as, as somebody that I would think very highly of. And, and at some point along the way, I found that found out that he was gay. And so it was like, oh well, this is this is this is the icing on the cake here. So I um, I didn't know who he was, but at the moment that I met him, until he introduced himself, I wasn't quite sure because he was known for carrying a, a walking stick, um, and he didn't have it that afternoon. You know, most of the times you see him walking around in the city, uh, he would have his walking stick or one of his walking sticks with him. He had quite a large collection of them. But for whatever reason, he didn't have one that day. But then, of course, when he introduced himself, you know, bingo, I knew who he was. Right on. Well, as he is getting more and more acknowledgement for being the architect or the organizer for that march on Washington and on Selma, what exactly does that actually mean? What did he do that was so special? Well, I think, you know, Bard was somebody who, sometimes was sent into exile because as you know, he was a gay man. He had a kind of a checkered radical political past. He had, ser uh, he had served time in prison during World War II for refusing to go into the army. So he had a lot of what we would refer to as baggage mm -hmm. that mainstream America might not find so appealing. But at the same time, he was such a great intellect and such a creative organizer that even when he was sent into the wilds, shall we say, uh, when he was expelled from Dr. King's inner circle in 1960 um, or other times, sooner or later, they would need him. They would call him right. back because they needed right. something done. Mm -hmm. And Bayard, Bayard was a meticulous organizer. I mean, every little thing that needed to be looked into, he would you know, start jotting it down on paper in in his handwriting, and eventually uh, one of his assistants or somebody would would type this up. So if you look into the 
manuals. There were a couple of organizing manuals in the 1963 March. Every little detail of what might conceivably could happen uh, was kind of uh, planned. They, mm. they, they, uh, they made contingency plans in case something was going to happen because, you know, of course, people had never experienced anything like the march before in Washington. And there was a lot of fear. Uh, the city emptied out. Um, a lot of the stores were closed. The Kennedy administration was, was terrified that there was going to be violence and looting and rioting and things like that. And, but, but Bayard planned it so carefully, and he, and he worked. He worked with the authorities. He worked with the police department so that um, things, you know, things actually went very smoothly. But it was really his being able to think of all of those options, all of those details, all of those possibilities that made things so seem, you know, it's like a Broadway show from the audience. It seems like it's seamless. Mm -hmm. But then when you go backstage, you realize how complicated it is. You said something, because I interviewed you like many years ago, and you said something that I quote all the time. You said that Dr. Martin Luther King gave the speech of his life at the very end of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and that never would have happened without the meticulous planning of Bayard Rustin. And I just wanted to make sure that that was said with you here on the air, because I think that as people remember Bayard, that they need to remember that. Of all the things that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in his life, a lot of that was springboarded by his appearance at the March on Washington at the very end <laughs> because of what Bayard did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they deliberately, Bayard knew that nobody would want to follow Dr. King's speech. Mm -hmm. um, not because he knew what Dr. King was going to say, but he just knew what a great orator he was. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, who would want to go on after him? Mm -hmm. So they put him on at the end. But, you know, people don't ever really think about, well, what would have happened had there been a disruption or had there been um, trouble at the March on Washington and suddenly they had to clear the stage and everybody had to go home. That speech might uh, would not have been given at that time. Exactly. 